Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the perfect dark of extreme metal podcasts. I am the death metal guy, a.k.a. wearing my Burzum shirt to the Mayhem show. Ooh, edgy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I am the black metal guy, a.k.a. crepuscular ejaculation. <laughs> usually I wait usually I wait a little bit later in the evening but uh, you know you had a tough day I can see it being important <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh, no I was a, no, I, I, I specifically did my AKA because I do remember uh, one time I was going to see Mayhem and I just happened to be wearing my Burzum shirt at the time and I was like Maybe I'm gonna switch shirts. This seems a little. This seems a little gauche. You know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure at this point, Burzum shirts are just part of the the background fabric of their existences, so they probably don't think about it that much. But still, you know. Well, least. but but see, in the old black metal culture, that would have been serious, right? Mm-hmm. Like like back back in you know like um them them, them was. Them with stabbing shirts. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm imagining some like corpse painted FSU bros like jumping you for wearing the Burzum shirt at uh, the Mayhem show or something. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, the, the old spirit is definitely the old spirit is definitely getting shanked by some psychotic teenager. Um, it's a like not a fatal shanking, but an inconvenient shanking. Just a, a quick little stick to let you know what's up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. Um. Well, it was, speaking of black metals, real quick, I got to do the. Uh, I guess we forgot to do this last week, but we got to do the shout out to uh, Onilar from uh, Dark and Nocturne Slaughter Cult. Uh, you've seen the uh, the news with her, right? No, I I heard some. I, I, I've heard her name a lot, but I don't know what the news is. Oh, yeah, apparently Onilar, so uh, DNS has been super quiet this whole year, and she just revealed a couple weeks ago that the reason for that is because she uh, got diagnosed with breast cancer. And, uh, oh, she's, fuck. Well, she's, she's only announcing it now that the treatment's done. She's already had, uh, you know, she's gone through her chemo and her radiation and her, uh, her surgery, mm-hmm. and uh, apparently she's all clear now. But, uh, I mean, yeah, she just, she said nothing while she was actually dealing with it and then only revealed it at the end with, uh, actually a, a pretty cool picture, like, uh, that they've got on all their social media of her holding her, uh, her braid that she had to cut off when she lost her hair. Cause you oh, remember she had like that incredibly long hair. Oh shit. Yeah. Life. Huh. But like in the picture that she posted, it's her holding the braid with this weird sort of like veil like head covering with her makeup on so it's pretty cool you know it's like this sucks that this happened but we can we can turn this into a a different sort of black metal imagery from it so that's that's pretty cool i think you know yeah for sure it's um well yeah that's um what Fuck, I am. I know nothing about stand-up comedy. So Norm Macdonald. It's a little yeah, like a yeah, Norm yeah. Macdonald approach, right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Uh, just don't talk about it until it ends, mm-hmm. one way or another. But uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad she's okay, and yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, um, I'm glad she handled it like a warrior. Yeah. No. I'm. Uh, yeah. It's, I'm very glad to hear that. We're we definitely. Uh, we definitely support Dark and Nocturne Slaughter Cult on the show. Twenty years doing like some of the truest black metal that's still out there, and uh, maybe, yeah, maybe so, the only band, maybe the only band that you could mean say meaningfully sounds like Mayhem. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I guess Sorgwanazia now kind of does too in a in a different way, but um, yeah. Off the top of my head, very few bands, like, I suppose you could find, like, shitty kind of clone bands here and there, Mm -hmm. but as far as bands that, like, meaningfully access what was cool about certain parts of Mayhem and carry it forward, DNS was certainly doing that. I mean, they were doing it while all the Orthodox bands were dragging Mayhem through the dust. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, at this point, I mean, DNS is basically... They're borderline classics now. I mean, their first demo was like '99, mm-hmm. 
So, you know, after mm-hmm. second wave, but definitely not nowadays black metal. Um, but I'm guessing, you know, they stay pretty active, so hopefully there will be a, a new record soon, and we'll definitely cover it on the show, because I was just uh, listening to some of their older stuff the other day when I heard this news, and it's like, oh yeah, this this still holds up 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, beyond that, so nowadays black metal, we don't, we don't have any, like, submissions this week or anything, but uh, we've talked about, you know, maybe using this as just catching up on, you know, what we've mm-hmm. been listening to lately, so I've got a little thing to show you. So uh, there is a new split that just came out a couple weeks ago between a Quebecois black metal band called De La Terre and Sarcrista. Uh, it's called Opus Blasphematum. Um, so Sarcrista obviously sounds like Sarcrista. There's no surprises to be found there. But uh, I was kind of curious to talk about De La Terre, who I had never heard before, and apparently they've been around for a little while. Um, it's definitely within the franco finnish milieu but mm-hmm. uh it is really really super over driven in that direction so let's listen to a little mm-hmm. bit off the end of their second track uh verminanda and uh we'll see, see what you think about this all right good um yeah i like it better than sarkrista for sure um uh sort of um there there are like three layered guitars right uh Um, yeah always two occasionally a third pops and it's mm -hmm. it's pretty it's pretty complex and in terms of length of riffs and harmony yeah like the basic harmonic ideas are pretty straightforward but it's it's the the arrangements are complex um it's kind of plays into the most delicate kind of intervals and textures but it's got a really forward production um Mm -hmm. it sounds very three-dimensional in a way that is uncommon with this stuff uh case in point sarkrista right um yeah yeah. i I think it's I, i mean um you know it's definitely sort of and it sounds a little more like just stuff coming. I would say it sounds a little closer to the stuff from Antic or uh, the, you know, the, the other French bands right now. Yeah, I'd agree. I I, I think that it's definitely mm-hmm. well. I mean, obviously, given its origin, it's going to be more on the French side of the whole Franco Finnish thing. And then you can hear a little bit of like Magla arrangement tucked away in the back. I was gonna, yeah, a little bit of that for sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a who's who of like 
modern black metal trends, but I think it's really well executed. I really enjoyed their side of the split. Um, but I guess I want to bring this up because uh, I, I, I had kind of a, a, a somewhat hot take that we've probably talked about a little bit on the show in some form, but I'm starting to really believe it now. My question is, has this style of black metal, has this just replaced melodic death metal? Like Melodeth, like Gothenburg stuff? Is this just the the new iteration of that, really? Um, well, it's, I mean, I like that as an idea. Um, it's hard because the whole sort of, like, ecosystem of the, the whole way people are buying the music now is different, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, um, all these bands, uh, unless you're listening to, like, really, like, fifth-tier proxy shit, like, mm -hmm. all of these bands, none of them are, like, mainstream metal bands, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, like, none of them are getting flogged particularly hard by the metal press. Um, you, ha I mean, you can think of bands that this sound has trickled down to, right? But the, the people yeah. doing it you know the, the 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 serious bands are not in the mainstream per se but they are it's easy to find them on youtube mm -hmm. right and it's easy to find them on bandcamp uh and it is really popular in the way Bellow death is uh and it's certainly not to the average ear now i suppose you could say this music is somewhat less accessible than like i don't know the jester race is right but, like, to the average ear now, is it less accessible than the Jester Race was to the average ear in the 90s? Probably not, right? Yeah, I think I think the crux um, of my argument is is that... <clears throat> I, I think that I, this I, style... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I mean, I think it's filling a similar sonic niche. There's a weird thing where, like, you could go to Best Buy and buy the Jester Race. And there's a weird way where this is filling the same niche, but in the underground. Or the yeah. ostensible underground, right? There, whatever that means anymore, right? But certainly, like Della Terre isn't going to make, you know. I mean, hopefully they break even at their shows, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, you kind of touched on. It. I guess for me, it's that uh, <clears throat> basically that this style fulfills a similar purpose to what like Gothenburg stuff ended up being, mm -hmm. which is uh, extreme metal pop music. You know, mm -hmm. for yeah, yeah, casual yeah. listening specifically. You know, we like back in um, back when I was in high school in the mid two thousands. Like metal heads who were into extreme metal, but just casually listening, hanging out with their friends, were all listening to Amana Marth and uh, Black Dahlia, and you know, still in flames at that point, stuff like that. And I feel like, to a certain degree, if I'm just, like, within, like, mixed metalhead company, uh, I'll just throw on Sargeist or something, because just everybody likes that. You know, uh, same, mm -hmm, honestly, mm -hmm. even with Satanic Warmaster, you know, both of these are, like, quality yeah. bands that I like a lot, but they have that, that kind of flattening effect that it's like, oh, everybody's kind of into this now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like, I, I go back and I find, every time I hear that first riff on the Jester Race and see the music video with, like, Titans throwing shit, I'm like, yeah, this is sick. And then, like, like you know, two minutes later, I'm like, I can't listen to this. Um, but, um, <laughs> uh, but I did listen to a bit of um, one of the, the gallery lately or not a bit of i think oh, i listened yeah. to all of the gallery and aside from one or two moments that were like really sort of like okay well that that sucks um aside from that it was pretty cool like a lot well, cooler than i expected really, especially the gallery is a really sophisticated uh, album yeah and it's pretty extreme they have i mean like they have a song on there that like approximate you can have a song they have a song on there where you can tell they're doing a nod to the whole sort of dissection thing um it's uh you know yeah i mean so like i mean i would say satanic war master in its essence is has at least one foot in even on stuff like 
has at least one foot in much grittier stuff. However, how people hear it today, for sure, I get what you mean. I, I do think, I, yeah, I, I take your point. Um, uh, and like, okay, so would you put... Is it specifically the Franco Finnish stuff? For instance, where would you put Migla? Because on the one hand, Migla is more popular probably than almost any of those bands individually. On the other hand, people perceive Migla as being serious in a way that nobody perceived um nobody perceived In Flames as being. Um I mean, Migla has its own niche as like one of the hot black metal bands. Although honestly, let's let's be frank, their their time in the sun is probably over, you know, as far as like massive mainstream success goes. Um, but like you were saying, yeah, they're considered a little more serious. You don't put Magla on at a party, really. You do that with no. Sargeist and Satanic mm-hmm. Warmaster. So, mm-hmm. I guess I'm also a little removed from like I like I I don't know many like. In, in my immediate IRL life, I do not know many, like, regular metalheads. So, I'm, I'm a little removed from that, I would say. I, I have more of a sense of what hardcore people are putting on at the bar. <laughs> and what's that? Knocked loose. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Hey, all This is Brandon from Cromley, and you're listening to Terminus. <laughs> All right, and we are back from talking about the Cromags to discuss, I mean, off air, uh, to discuss Nerve Butcherer by Concrete Winds out on Sepulchral Voice Records as well as independently on Bandcamp. So this is one of those records that I've been waiting since the beginning of Terminus to review, hoping that it would come out. Uh concrete the last concrete wins record primitive force which would have been uh, 2019 uh was like a revelation for me and really sort of one of those things that restores faith that there's uh there's gas in the old motorcycle yet um in terms of the uh extremity arms race Mm. uh what was remarkable about that was that they produced easily like i mean the most extreme guitar and blast beat oriented music being made right now pretty much and they did it by uh they did it as the most original bands always do by returning to the origin by uh um you could tell that a lot of the influence was coming they were producing music that sounded very much like a more a sort of extremely dynamic and uh, noise blasted and challenging version of war metal, um, but they were producing it by drawing. Probably you could get almost the entire sound out of, uh, you know, discharge, rain and blood, uh, repulsion, and I think they were really into carcass. Uh, you could throw one more band on there or something, but. Um, and accessing the parts of those bands that have gotten flattened out of our, uh, oh, Creator would obviously be not, but Repulsion Creator, you know. Uh, and um, accessing the, the sort of sheer noise racket aspect of those bands mixed with a sort of propulsive sense of groove that is the source of the aggression in that music. Um, and th- they produce this sort of dizzying ear shredding music that was also deeply intuitive and physical and riff oriented and you know like just reminded me of all my favorite bands from when i first got into extreme metal so i really like this band i've been stoked for this to come out uh i played it for you uh death metal guy on this show back in the day Mm -hmm. and i uh, i went back and listened to uh primitive force just the other day to uh, prep for this one and what do you think? Oh, it's really good. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's like my 
my take on the sample we played on the show was like, oh yeah, this is immediately up my alley, and then the rest of the album sounds like that. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, I think one thing you, yeah, we did that on episode, uh, of course now I clicked off the fucking window because I'm massively ADD. Yeah, episode Lucky 13, one of the, um, one of the first listenable episodes of Terminus, um, and we mentioned it with a sample and some extended discussion in our review of, uh, probably my favorite brutal death metal band that death metal guy has shown me induced um and you know you pointed out that in many ways concrete winds is pro- drawing on drawing on different ingredients to produce kind of brutal death metal effects right. yeah well i mean like the best i mean the, that's the great thing about that album is that it's drawing from you know the the ideas the kind of musical dna are all rooted in like really primitive early death metal but the execution is drawing from all the technical innovations of brutal death and modern styles you know yes they've completely the interesting thing is yes it's not remotely retro at all they are completely current with what is happening and the idea is how can we one up that um and and uh they do it by going around behind it so to speak uh the um uh you know i mean another that in terms of like, yeah, what, what was I going to say? Um, uh, yeah, it's brain fart. So yeah, it was fucking <laughs> sick. Let's talk about the new record. Um, it is, um, I think, you know, I think we kind of ended up having exactly the same read on this one. So yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it, I, we've been getting that more and more with certain things. It's, um, uh, it's there's a terminus a terminus style uh, developing the but um, mind is fully established at this point. yes yes there's now a third entity that is neither of us called uh, <laughs> if you're listening to this and you notice a new cyst on your body don't worry it's just our eggs budding <laughs> um but uh basically it sounds like what they did was well after you put out a record like that you're like fuck okay well how can we one-up ourselves right how can we make something that's even more extreme uh and uh based on they they actually did some interviews for this record and they're hilarious because they basically just say the people the guy asked them questions they just say we tried to make the most obnoxious unlistenable music possible um (laughs) like that's their answer to everything um And, you know, we've talked on this show about how, you know, people are, one of the problems with extreme metal now is that people are no longer trying to uh, terrify, shame, or uh, overwhelm people with their riffs, right? And this band is, right? They're playing for keeps. Uh, So the way they one-upped it, though, is they, I think to a degree, they've gone in... The first half of this record especially, it seems like what they've done is they've ratcheted up the... They've tried to ratchet up the extremity by ratcheting up the blast beats, basically. Uh, The blasting, the choppiness, um, and maybe the more sort of uh, frantic, cellular lead-driven guitar stuff. Sort of like dissonant chords and stuff. Um, and, And it's more sort of choppy. Um, and this makes it more extreme in some sense, but also way more like other kinds of extremity that we're very familiar with. And for instance, like the plebeian grandstand from the other week and like the plebeian grandstand from the other week, right? That's a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, it's, it's not powerful. Whereas primitive force was primitive force. However, I mean, of course, this band's way better than... Play- Even when this band is doing the more scronky stuff, they're way better than Plebeian Grandstand. Uh, however, and, you know, and the album as a whole is still pretty fucking sick, especially because of the tracks on the back end. Yeah. And how would you describe those? So, well, the, the back half basically sounds like Primitive Force Part 2. Yeah, to yeah. Um, like you were saying up front, we have basically identical reads on this. Um first half it's it's almost odd how clearly divided this record is into two halves um you've got well you've got the opening track the title track which is basically like primitive force 
and mm-hmm. then it goes on a tear of like four tracks in a row that are very scronky and needling um and then it kind of the death metal center of the music reasserts itself on the back half of the record it's very strange and it seems like it was a deliberate choice like uh, because mm-hmm. the 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 divide is so harsh between the two of them <clears throat> so uh, what interests me about concrete winds and what i do get for a good half of this record is uh the reinterpretation of these really primitive extreme metal riffs with modern technique you know the way mm-hmm. they're accessing the ideas of bands like you know like master or mm-hmm. uh you know necrovore uh i'm death strike i think you were gonna bring them up as well you know all this sort of mm-hmm. proto very extreme death rash as well as you know early primitive grindcore uh napalm death uh, like scum era repulsion terrorizer and there's a whole way that these things get we've talked about this before but there's a whole way that these things get put in different genres retrospectively but concrete winds is clearly more interested in all of these and how they connected to each other and to alters of madness than to like anything from after that <laughs> yeah. basically and we're starting to we're starting to see um more and more death metal nowadays that is trying to access those kinds of weird early spaces. Mm. Like uh, there was the Forgotten Tomb record from last year, the mm-hmm. Forgotten Tomb from Chile uh, that nobody knows about, but that was a great record last year. Uh, there's the uh, Tiradero de Cadavres record uh-huh. from yeah, this yeah. year, accessing similar ideas. And basically, Concrete Winds hovers around similar ideas, but they're doing it with just way more technical accomplishment. Um, like clearly these guys are listening to modern brutal death metal and they're probably listening to you know modern death spell omega and stuff like that um so like i said you know the melodic ideas the certain like primitive force of the riffs um is driven by like mid to late 80s musical ideas but they're filtered through this horrible machinery of like modern brutal death and like abstract black metal technique so I basically agree with you that I, I, I'm probably not as big on this record as you are. I do like it, but I think I don't have as much time for the first half of it as you might no, just because I'm a bigger fan. I'm a big fan of the band, but I also agree that I don't like that stuff just sort of goes by me. Um, yeah, I mean, was, like it, it was weird. And it, it is a case where I was a little worried that like, because I was so invested in specific things about the first record, right? Like, I was invested in the way it... We'll get into it, but I was invested in the way that there were things that were specifically, like, thrashy about it, right? In that sort of death strike, discharge, or slayer way, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. There were... um, There was this kind of, like, space and definition in the music and things like that, or the way they... I mean, we coined the terms... or music adjacent to describe this band right yeah. it's this yeah. is they're writing things that work exactly like all your favorite sick extreme metal riffs they're just working in parallel to them and sound horrific and wrong right or like yeah. taking taking the Kerry king solo and turning it into a riff style i i loved all that and so i was a li- when i heard the first part of this it was like well this just sounds kind of like blasty and choppy uh I was a little worried that maybe I had over it, like, you know, sometimes you got to follow the band where it leads, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, but sometimes bands do, I think, sort of latch on to things in their sound that maybe aren't the thing that makes them special uh, and really sets them apart. And so I think, like, um, I was waiting to hear your take. You know what I mean? Well, like, I wanted to make sure it wasn't... I wanted to make sure I wasn't just, like, uh, um, like less interested in this one because it didn't fit my ideal of the first one. No, you see, because I, th- I think what's interesting about this record... Uh, well, one of the things is that it is very telling that the stuff that is the most ostentatiously extreme with all the like, Mm -hmm. you know, piercing high frequency lead guitar loops Mm -hmm. and stuff is fundamentally not as extreme. 
as the back yep. half of the record because the first half is something like a, we know what that sounds like we've wrapped our heads around that we can't be surprised by that any, anymore but what concrete winds does as a band their core sound that sort of abstract angular mm-hmm. death metal riffing that doesn't sound like anybody else that is something we're still not used to and as a result even if it's basically the same kind of thing as the first record that ends up being the most extreme material yes and also you know the whole point is just like like what we're yeah yeah the the later stuff on the record is more not only more distinctive it's also just literally stronger like uh like I keep coming back to it, like I did with the Plebeian Grandstead. But the point of this music is 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 raw power, right? And like, uh, even if you've heard it, like I mean, producing something that is shrieky, more shrieky and noisy than anyone else has done before, is like that is an achievement the first time someone does it, right? And then after that, yeah, it's, a, it's an admirable goal, but you know. yeah, you yeah, sure you can do it. And then the question is, is it heavy? Is it powerful? Is it cool? Right? I mean, and the point is that arms race has already been the extremity arms race is not there, in fact. That's an illusion. That sort of that sort of stylistic extremity has been pushed to its logical conclusion years ago. We know we, we know what that's like. Uh mm-hmm. the what makes this band so extreme is the sort of disciplined but totally unhinged, like live performed riffing so let, let's let's play them some stuff yeah um uh i'll do the beginning so I, I think you're right that nerve butcherer does sound more like primitive force but uh there this sample divides up pretty neatly between the first half is some motifs that you heard on primitive force that are being used here but in a much more sort of uh wall of noise kind of way and then something that's a lot more like what made that first record special. And I think listeners will be able to hear. You can hear that thing they drop back into at the end. The ba dum ba dum ba da 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 That's like a primitive force. Primi- uh, that's like a concrete winds almost like like m- most. This point, that's almost their theme. They're like their theme riff. Um, they they use variations of that structure everywhere. But yeah, so you can hear how at the beginning there was that kind of uh, uh, the blasting, and then suddenly you get this clearly defined sort of just rigid half blast thing and the vocal is just oh ah, <laughs> right um and that is it's so sick and well, it's um a, they, they like to do this thing where um you know other bands like to use the discordant blasting as the punctuation at the end of kind of coherent musical ideas mm-hmm. these guys do the opposite it's the the mm-hmm. coherent musical idea is the punctuation for like the noise blast stuff yeah and what what's cool about that part is you can just do that 
<laughs> like that, like there are, that's the sort of like tapping back into the originary impulse, the original impulse of extreme metal, right? That's like, there are all these things you can do within a very traditional framework, right? That's just power chords and blast beats, staggered blast beats, right? That sound still today, nobody has done and sound outrageous and crushing, right? And, um, and there are things that people haven't done because of arbitrary ideas of how a song is supposed to sound. And one of the things that makes this band great is they have no preconceived ideas of how a song is supposed to sound. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, um, con- I guess here's, here's me putting it in a nutshell. Concrete Wind's greatest strength is the ability to uh, make you feel for a whole album like the uh, like how you felt for the first 30 seconds you heard Revenge the first ex- time. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. And not not any time after that with Revenge, but those first 30 seconds when you're 17, they can do a whole album I mean, of that feeling. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, for me, like the first 30 seconds of Rain and Blood or something. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Which, which when I heard it was, you know, um, you know, uh, cold and strange and extraordinarily dissonant. And I'd already at that point listened to like Jane Doe and shit, right? But the mm-hmm. kinds of dissonance in in Rain and Blood were different. And I mean, we should we, we we can talk about that at some point here. But um, but yeah. So what what's what's your next sample? All right. So this is uh, both of my samples are off the uh, the back half of the record, just because I mm-hmm. strongly prefer that side of it. Mm-hmm. So let's get to a track called uh, Flaying and Turnacine. So at first blush, when you listen to this stuff, it sounds super chaotic. It sounds like it's basically kind of formless. Um, in actuality, it's it's rigidly structured. It's just very fast. And, you know, it's, a, it's based off a kind of assemblage of micro riffs that add up to these longer phrases and these longer musical ideas. I mean, structurally, this stuff has a lot in common with Brutal Death, I think. Like, modern mm-hmm. Brutal Death. Um, and Flaying and Turnacine is a great example of how there really are songs buried underneath here. But the way they're structured tends to be... Uh, it's a sort of like Brutal Death. It's around a single motif, but the idea is that the band extends out from that motif and then returns to it and kind of just feathers out in these like rhythm, uh, these like ribbon like patterns back to the central idea, which is kind of like how Morgan hmm. Angel would write songs. Um, it's not quite a chorus, but it is like a refrain that the track keeps returning to. Hmm. Um, and I'll get into the idea of some, uh, some other influences after we play it, but let's listen to it. I, I think I hear what you mean about Morbid Angel doing just from the instant you said that, that like makes sense of things that I've heard in Morbid Angel. That's a good no, description. Well, you, were, you were mentioning Morbid Angel earlier in, in yeah. the context of this band, you know, Alters of Madness is clearly a primary influence. Oh, and we talked about this before, but the guy drums like Pete Sandoval. Um, yes, you yes, can he does. you can hear, and I mean that as like a huge compliment, right? You can hear the sick thing. What this guy has mastered is the sort of like setup for like when Pete Sandoval is about to do a blast beat. It's like watching a falcon turn in midair to stoop, right? It's <laughs> just like um, it's like yo, here it comes, <laughs> you know. It's 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 this um. Th- I, I don't even know how to describe it. There's a particular kind of pausing setup, and then it just sounds like a ton of bricks falling. And this guy is very good at producing that effect. Oh well, if you want to get if you want to get Sandoval death metal drumming, what you do is you extend your fills out twice as long as they would be in any other mm-hmm. band. That's that's honestly one of the biggest things with Sandoval is just these super extended fill phrases that create so much drama when he goes back into the blast beat. So basically, what you're mm-hmm. saying. Um, but let's listen to a uh, flaying and turn scene and try to, despite all the noise that's going to happen, let's try to think about it in a more, more kind of structural way. <laughs> Yeah. 
I didn't even think about it when I was originally listening to this, but that's super Morbid Angel. Like, there's several riffs in just that sample that could have been plucked directly off of, like, uh, Formulas Fatal to the Flesh or Games. Or just some of those more streaming, kind of, like, groovy tremolo riffs, mm-hmm. riffs, like the one at the very end, that... Yeah, oh, yeah, that, that one was sick. Yeah. yeah. So there's that, and then the other thing that I didn't really notice on Primitive Force, but has to be a primary influence, um, has to be, like, Pete Helmkamp stuff. Like, Angel Corpse, Mm. uh, Order from Chaos, stuff like that. And Helmkamp's work is something that I've always appreciated from a distance, but I've never really liked listening to that much. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the idea and the energy behind it, but the riffs just kind of never really grabbed me. But I I think that's a primary idea for these guys um because you get the vibe of this is pretty similar to listening to um like the inexorable uh by angel course uh Mm -hmm. this sort of like overwhelming wall of driving force you know Mm -hmm. um but i think these guys just do it in a more interesting way you know more of those choppy rhythmic variations you know and that's the brutal death guy in me also the Uh, the harmonies are less i mean it's been a long time since I've listened to Angel Corpse. I've I enjoyed some of that for sure, but he, the riffs there are closer to traditional Black Death metal riffs. Yeah, right? or, yeah, they're... or black thrashing Black Death. You know, whatever that whole that whole subset of like riff oriented war metal. Yeah, you're um, you're able to predict the interval choices a lot more. But mm-hmm. like I was saying, structurally on this, you hear how they keep going back to the those simple, like brutal death, like cellular phrases, just that simple little, da 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 da. You know, that's that little one three one four kind of thing mm-hmm. that forms the that's the seed of like half the riffs on this song. Mm-hmm. You know, half of them start with that phrase. They'll play with the rhythm, maybe they'll palm mute it. You know, they'll speed it up, slow it down, but it's ultimately all revolving around that that kind of germinal idea. Um, So I find that really interesting, especially on the back half of this record. These really wild, chaotic songs are actually deeply structured. And the more you listen to them and the more you can anticipate the shapes and the changes, uh, kind of the more fun you have with it, I think. Yeah, it's definitely, as a record, I mean, I think I wish there were more straight-up thrash riffs on this, like there were on Mm -hmm. the last one. There's a lot less... I, I think there are. They're just so fast there, you know? Well, there are thrash riffs on that. I guess what I mean is, like, there would be parts, like, uh, well, did you, where they just rip a Slayer beat on the last one. And there might be a few on the back end, but it's... This is much denser. But I think it's true that on the back end, the density resolves into... Uh, the density resolves into the same kind of riffiness on Primitive Force. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, like, I don't know, like... What was it? White Cut Manifest or whatever that's the has big a one. yeah. That's got like that's that's got like I believe that one has sick thrash thrash riffing on it. Um, this is a uh, um a couple ones. Um, I I will not. Well, I just like every song on that record, Jesus. Um, <laughs> like, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a. Uh, I mean, title track, too. But there's a... But, like, in terms of, like, that... The riffiness of the first one, you can hear... The first one had a lot more sort of extended, clearly set-off, repetitive riff sequences. And that was a thing I liked about it a lot. That it was so based on the classic art of the battering, repetitive riff sequence... This does not have that, but I think you're right that the second the second half of the record extends on that idea by doing the same thing just in like three times as fast, right? And just Whatever, doing right, splitting that single riff into permutations of itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So and so yeah, let's listen to. I mean, yeah, we'll do your other sample. Okay. Yeah, this is the final track on the record. Uh, Astomatis vomiting. Um, and really, I just picked this one because I just really like the track, and uh, I've got another influence that I think might be primary to this band that comes out a lot more on this record compared to Primitive Force, so All right. give this one a shot. <laughs> Thank you. 
you know, I'm the I'm the guy that always does this, but I, I think that if you strip away some of the excessive slayerisms, like the the crazy chromatic solos and mm -hmm. some of the super abrupt kind of modern uh, rhythmic formulas, you get something surprisingly close to like the first Cryptopsy record, Blast huh. Made Flesh. Um, there, there's something about this. I, I think that might be a primary influence just in the way they arrange these songs with these protracted, almost like deliberately obnoxious blast sections with these kind of like looping, dissonant phrases, like barely riffs at all, before it rips back into like a, a more rhythmically developed part of the song. Um, I don't know. There, something about this strikes me as like it's tapping into early Cryptopsies interest in like both being dynamic and being like very deliberately grading at the same time yeah well i mean even just the dynamism makes sense like i can hear that for sure um well i mean the real clincher is at the end when they they do that little that b little bell ting and then go into the uh go into that their version of a breakdown because mm -hmm. uh, i still remember when we when we did our first bonus episode where we were talking about uh none so vile and you were talking about how like the time frame for none so vile it seems to like scoop certain hardcore techniques that wouldn't really come into prominence until a couple years later it's it's interesting all the way all this stuff sort of shapes together yeah yeah, yeah. um it's uh so yeah i mean that one is sick i don't have much more to say about that one but here's a um yeah. <laughs> here i think about our general point about this band and, right, is that the, they're at their best when they're generating the, when the obnoxious, dissonant, um, completely unfriendly stuff is being generated in sort of like, uh, like, like in sort of, uh, in in hearable forms in structures that you can like uh that that you can latch on to with your ear and that you can uh relate to physically that you can move to uh and um that that have something to do with the time of the body um and uh there is a and and the bands that do that best and and also that like at their best they're accessing a way of being dissonant and a way of being anti-musical that is not very very different from the plebeian grandstand approach which is this sort of dispersed corded fragmented sort of deliberate self-shattering thing right um uh and so as an example of that sort of like clearly defined crushing noise uh, I, I thought we should listen to some Discharge, right? Uh, and specifically, like, in metal, we often refer back to hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing. You know, the full length, and which has some conspicuous, which is, you know, kind of like, Protest and Survive is like every Metallica song after that. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they basically sort of um, invent extreme, the basic vocabulary of extreme metal on that. But I, I went back recently and I was like, I should listen to Why again. And I was like, damn, this is this is sick. And in some ways, Why is actually less accessible. Because riffs now work a lot more like riffs do on Hear Nothing. Even the really dissonant ones. Uh, um, and on Why, like... Uh, the first track in particular, I, I, I went, I clicked through this looking for the most abrasive thing I could find, and it's still the first track, which, like, the rest of the riffs on here, like, if you listen to, like, Crushing Death Metal, if you listen to, if you really listen to early Scandinavian Black Metal, if you listen to a variety of other stuff, they're going to make sense to your ear, right, uh, as just brutal dissonant riffing. This is still a nonsense song, and it's it's just absolutely it's it's disgusting and bulldozing. So uh, I can remember hearing this for the first time and just being like, after I'd heard Slayer, and be like, "What the fuck is this?" So uh, like, this is awesome, but I have to I have to meet it on its terms. 
you know. So let's listen to Visions of War. I can definitely hear it. I mean, that forms the basic toolkit of Napalm Death and Siege and, and you know, just a, a lot of extreme music in general. This is this is before See Nothing, Hear Nothing, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I will say he did get a he did get a lot better on vocals for the full length. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, they're 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 an acquired taste, but I I, I like them. Yeah, it's sort of oh, fry. He's figuring out how to. He's inventing that style, right? Yeah, yeah. and he's, he's figuring out how to just like roar really loud. Yeah, how do you do it? How do you do an aggressive vocal? And so, yeah, yeah, I hear exactly what you mean. The moment where it sort of like fl- it sort of flattens, fl- you know, so you get you get the vocal fry, and then it's like oh, my blinds, my you know. lies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It gets a little <laughs> bit. Uh, um, well, God, if you want to hear something really funny, listen to Grave New World, where he's trying to sing like hair metal. Um, but uh, no, I um, prefer not to. Thanks. Oh man, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of legendary how quick that like tanked them. Um, uh, it's one reason that their reputation wasn't really revived beyond like the crust scene until like the block spot era. Like, uh, um, but. Um, Although a lot of the metalcore bands in the '90s were listening to them, like Integrity for sure. Uh, but um, the uh, anyway, like so that that is that's a good example of that is not particularly fast. That is certainly not chaotic. Although certain people heard it as that and misunderstood it. Um, that is a you know hypnotically repetitive, uh, elementally simple riff. That's just arranged in a way that sort of uh, frustrates expectations and kind of just um, moves, you know, uh, moves notes around the fretboard by pure force of will. Um, yeah. And and at its best, like uh, Concrete Winds is doing a much more technical and uh, modernized version of that even the solo there you can hear like there's the first noise solos right that becomes carrie king um but uh but yeah anyway so there there's my soapbox about discharge and extremity um and now uh here's another special feature about concrete winds another way in which they kind of their talent for just doing things that nobody else thought to do or that were sort of placed off table from the the get-go. Like, oh, that's not how songs go, right? In the same way, there's sort of, there are a lot of unstated rules about like how extreme metal songs work or like what can be an extreme metal. Um, And one thing that was really cool about the last one was the song Tyrant Pulse. Uh, And they do... I guess they have an equivalent of that on this one, 
just called dissolvent baptism. I'm not going to tell people what is, I'm not going to ruin the surprise. Let's just listen to, this is like 40 seconds into the song. That's right. They put Comba Christ in your war metal. <laughs> um, and you love it. Uh, that is, I mean, so they, they Tyrant Pulse was like that too, except it moved at more of a clip. It kind of had more of a kind of ministry beat and then would drop into more blasting. But what makes these songs work is um, they take the most legitimately extreme ignorant sort of reptile brain sort of like goth club sex beats and put them in extreme metal and why not right <laughs> um like uh that is and they do it without doing a novelty number right you could do the whole track as like this is a I don't know, you know, what, what, what the fuck is that, that, that should, you know, this is, this is our like take on like an industrial, nineties industrial or like an agrotech song or whatever. And they don't do that at all. They are simply recontextualizing technique, right? Like the phrase literally, like each of those phrases ends with blast beats. Um, and they're playing that sort of, uh, fist pump riff in exactly the same way they play the staggered power chords under that the ooh ah on nerve butcherer um so it's it's very holistically worked into their music and this is why isn't this stuff why, why don't people use beats like this at extreme metal well i mean obviously it's out of place in certain things for sure right uh but it's mostly, you know, sort of subcultural prohibitions that, you know, sort of existed for a reason, right? We've all got to be hostile narrow teenagers. And, like, that sort of competition helped produce some of the best music of the early 90s. But at this point, there's no reason for a band to put certain techniques off limit from the get-go unless it's a deliberate strategy, right? And this band, is there's nothing off limits here.
we're back with our second record of the night, and uh, it's kind of weird now that we're doing the like the two review format. It's like it feels like we just cover like big stuff now. We're selling out, dude. You know. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, we I had mean, to eventually. Yeah, we're selling out, covering concrete wins and arch goat. Yes, <laughs> <It's> that, like... <laughs> that that is what we're covering. We're covering the new arch goat record. Worship oh, only. The inter- only the finest hellish noise from Finland. Uh, That's true. We've got a we got a double Finland episode. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought about that when we started up. Um, so yeah, we've got it's, Archgoats worship the eternal darkness out on Devemer Morty. Devemer Morty. Where is it? So, Archgoat is a band we've talked about in passing several times on the show. Um, I've been, uh, I wouldn't say following them, but, you know, listening to them here and there basically since I've been getting into metal. Um, but uh, Archgoat's actually been kind of a blind spot for you. This is the uh, this is the first full record by them you've listened to, right? Um, probably, yeah. I listened, you showed me some Horror of Bethlehem, and then I listened to, like, half of the rest of it, and then got kind of bored. Um, but, like, <laughs> uh... But the tracks you showed me hit very hard. Yeah. Um, um, Archgoat is a, an interesting band to talk about on a show like this. Uh, so so I, saw, I saw Archgoat live one time, and I think that's probably the ideal setting, is like Archgoat plays their hits for 35 minutes, you know? <laughs> that's mm-hmm. with a bunch of people that are really, really into Archgoat. Um so, and that was a lot of fun. I did enjoy their set a lot. Uh, we uh, we actually have a framed Whore of Bethlehem poster in my house just because the oh, art's super lovely. Fun. Yeah, I saw him with my wife. Um, mm-hmm. But it, so Archgoat is weird to critically evaluate just because this is a band with such a bizarre history. You know, at this point, they've just kind of like receded into the background of bands everyone knows. But when you and I were coming up, that was the return of Archgoat. Not a lot mm-hmm. of people seem to remember that. You know, back when we were starting, Archgo was a thing that really cult people were into because... Um, it was they, like the thing that was more cult than Barrett. Yes, yes. Because, uh, you know, there were they did a couple demos and then they did the Angel Cunt EP. And then there was, uh, you know, that got re-released uh, as a split with uh, Beharit. You know, just like old material put together. And then they were basically just dormant, you know, basically from 93 to 2005. Then 05, they come back with a new EP, Angel Slaying, Black Fucking Metal, and then Whore of Bethlehem gets released in 2006. So, basically, I was into black metal and kind of, like, in the scene, so to speak, when Archgoat returned. Mm -hmm. And it was just a weird thing. It's like, why is this weird cult finish band coming back for a full length, you know, 15 years after they disappeared or something. Um, But then they came back, went on a tear, and have just been releasing tons of material ever since. So, it's weird seeing people talk about Archgoat now, talk about it like it's a... like it's a very stock kind of sound, when in actuality Mm there are some of the people who who developed it. I mean, there are some of the people who invented it. Archgoat, I have no doubt, was incredibly influential to a lot of the war metal bands that were coming out around when they came back. God, I mean, listening to this now, that that is very clear. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. I understand that this record is somewhat. I understand that there's some, maybe some change from their previous presentation on this, but like in terms of, it sounds like the basic framework is still pretty much the same, right? And oh, if yeah. yeah, if that's any evidence, then yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's I mean, this is like close to the default war metal sound now. Well, it's it's kind of interesting. It was like when uh, on a bonus episode, you know, I realized we totally forgot our housekeeping. I never plugged the social media or the Patreon or anything. See, and, and you were saying we sold out. <laughs> well, you guys do that. If you want to hear us talk on our bonus episodes and you want to support us on Patreon, get access to that, yada, yada, do that. So it's kind of like when we talked on the bonus episode about uh, Onward to Golgotha by Incantation, um, mm-hmm. which you hadn't heard before. And talking about the, the weird quality of like having heard everything that this thing influenced and then only later hearing the original mm-hmm. article. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I think something similar goes on with Arch Goat, where people are like, oh, this seems very, like, underdeveloped and stuff, when it's like, no, these are, this is the this is the fucking original thing but Mm -hmm. um so i'm curious as a guy who basically doesn't have experience with this band who have sort of become a cornerstone of this style uh what did you think of it i i like it um it's uh i know it you know i mean their thing seems to be right very uh i guess i don't know what would i say these are very different from blasphemy riffs, right? Mm-hmm. Right. The blasphemy riffs have this sort of meandering quality to them. Uh, a lot of bands, which is part of what's supposed to make—I I don't like them that much—but it's part of what's supposed to make them obscure and heavy, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It seems like a lot of bands are pretty bad at imitating the unique thing about. The blasphemy thing is one of those sort of inimitable things that comes from kind of inventing the riffs. Uh, yeah. And just being deranged, right? You know, being a deranged powerlifting skateboard skinhead in the early 90s. Uh, <laughs> um, this is... Uh, the riffing on Arch Goat is much more sort of uh, focused and minimal. Um, and it ends up... There are passages on here where I end up wondering, like, are they, is is this kind of a Marduk riff, or are Marduk riffs, like, are Panzer Division Marduk riffs like Archgoat riffs? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, Panzer Division Marduk was, Panzer Division Marduk was clearly influenced by Impaled Nazarene, more than anything Mm. else. Uh... And, you know, it's weird. There's the, almost like, you know, we talk about the Franco-Finnish sound in terms of the more melodic black metal. Well, the other Finnish sound is sort of, uh, well, there's a there's slower stuff like Ride for Revenge and Barathrum, but they're off in a corner. Um, the, the, if There's a kind of Finnish sound is just sort of maniac blasting noise that would include mm-hmm. everything from Morgal and Impaled Nazarene up through this in Concrete Winds, right? Well, I think uh, I think mentioning Ride for Revenge, it, it, it's really not that far off in a corner because I see stuff well, like Arch Goat and Beharit being directly feeding into the whole oh, Beast Universe no, style. No, sorry. I mean, Arch Ride for Revenge is very relevant to Arch Goat. I, I was trying to do one of those things where you like note a stylistic affinity that hasn't been sort of. I'm trying to cut across scenes a little bit here. I see, you know I what I mean? Being like, notice, Concrete Winds, Arch Goat, kind of, um, all these bands that sound kind of different, have a similar energy. Um, yeah. uh, and you could see things like Arch Goat and Impaled Nazarene being generative for later kinds of uh, stripped down blasting music, whether it's, um, I mean, certainly Diocletian, I think, takes a lot, like, more from this than I imagine. Like, right, people think of Diocletian as very blasphemy-influenced. Well, it's got to also be very this-influenced, especially on the slow parts. Um, And, uh, but yeah, Ride for Revenge, for sure, is connected to the slow parts of Archco, which in some ways are, like, maybe in the past, they're pretty central to the music. No, I, I've always thought of Arch Goat as a band that revolved around the stomp. You mm-hmm. know, I, th- I think that is the primary thing about Arch Goat. You know, people, I mean, Arch Goat has been influential to modern war metal, but I mean, half of Arch Goat's songs, or maybe more, are mid paced or just like kind of doomy in some ways. Mm-hmm. Just these huge stomping power chord black death tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, now, definitely, they have their, their fast moments, but those tend to be interrupters between the main sort of, like, groove-driven riffs that I really associate with these guys. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, basically, they... I think this is... In terms of what a groovy war metal riff sounds like, I think this this band is basically the paradigm. Like, yeah, when yeah. when a band throws a groovy riff in their war battle song, they're basically doing something like this. Um, the kinds of, like, flam-heavy rhythms that were on that sick uh, Upon the Altar record mm-hmm. seem very influenced by this, and there are certain rhythms here that remind me of the cake a lot. 
that the cake, you know, I think we mentioned Archgo during that review, right? But like, uh, yeah, 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 but, um, but the cake clearly draws on certain kinds of this sort of like slow knuckle dragging, uh, three against four ideas, just as deliberately stripped down as possible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Well, I mean, that's the other thing about Archgoat that separates them from the other war metal bands. And I'll get into this idea a little bit further on when we get to some of my samples. But I think the thing that makes Archgoat so distinct among war metal is that it is... Archgoat is really a heavy metal band in a way that a lot of the war metal bands no longer are. Um, I think they're fixated on very elemental heavy metal ideas and Celtic frost ideas from the eighties that have been Mm. kind of shucked away over time. And when they do pop up from other bands, they seem kind of stiff and unnatural here. That's Mm. one thing you cannot say about arch goat. Nothing that they do, no matter how left field it might seem at the time seems unnatural. It all feels perfectly contiguous within their influences and their history stretching back to like the second wave era. I mean, you got to remember mm-hmm. the first demo was in '91. They were they were there for the heart of it, and it's uh, mm-hmm. it's funny, you know. It's like 30 years later, people kind of forget that. But let's let's listen to some uh, let's listen to some Stompy Devil tunes. Uh, yeah. I threw uh, I threw your first one up front. You sampled a couple tracks from the beginning that mm-hmm. are a little bit more traditional Arch Goat, and I sampled a couple things that are a little bit different on this record. But let's uh, let's start with one of yours. That's nice. All right, so. Uh... You know, uh, this is Black Womb Gnosis, and when we were talking about the sort of uh, Concrete Winds kind of um, strain somewhat from the extreme thrash bedrock that made their music for so effective on Primitive Force, well, here is some bedrock extreme thrash. some very ripping thrashy stuff good evidence of the fact that you do not need to be literally playing fast to sound very fast yeah 
right? That's kind of a lumbering Slayer beat, and it rips, or Motorhead beat even. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, the real, obviously, the, the the real highlight there is that you know they they have the uh, um, you know the the satanic nun fuck samples over that massive riff drop in, <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah, the nuns are getting fucked. Um, and it's uh, and one thing I want to ask is so that that's like you're just swooping up like to the half step over the octave basically right how how do they make that sing so much that first leap up there's a bit of a slide and then it sounds like th- that top note rings in a way the top chord rings in a way it's like are they like shifting from two string power chords and then just it sounds like a power chord i don't think there's any fancy shit in there but are they just switching from two strings to like three strings I, I think the top I think one. that's part of it. I think they're adding the octave string in there, and mm-hmm. I think the part of it is also just like quietly very sophisticated production. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think this is just like this is one of those things that's like, oh yeah, this is r- raw ripping war metal. It's like no, this is actually super expensive oh. production. You know, <laughs> I was gonna say that I was yeah. The sound is great. It is dense. Um, dense but textured. You can hear that really at the end of that sample when you start to hear some of that. Um, you know, I'm crazy about those kinds of like overtone buzz drone buzz effects over guitars, mm-hmm. yeah. right? You get some like trem ghost over those last blast riffs, um, like some like some just this sort of hovering octave kind of, which is yeah, well, just being thrown off by the guitars. That's not a keyboard. Well, there is some subtle keyboard stuff throughout this record, mm-hmm. but it's very in the background. But that is probably just a shit ton of delay and reverb on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, it's like, I mean, honestly, the highlight for that is the the solo, which is so sophisticated. Like, it, it, <laughs> if it was anybody else, War Metal Kids would be like, Ooh, what the fuck is doing with this like melodic solo? And it's like, no, it's great. It's got a narrative. It pushes the song forward. It's not just taking up space. You know, um, which I think good soloing is a thing this has in common with Concrete Wins. Oh, yeah. Like the solos are that's a thing about their music that is I mean, there are so many things to say about that record still. It'll keep coming back here. But like one thing that makes their music unique is the solos are central to it and not filler. And same here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, and that that leads me really well into my first sample. Oh, Oh, wait, really quick. I want to say one other thing. Um, the song is really well structured, Black Womb Gnosis. Um, these are very simple, intuitive kinds of riff sequences, right? We've all written worse versions of these on our own guitars, right? Yeah. But, um, uh, um, right, there's a reason we're not in Archgoat, unfortunately. Um, but, um, uh, Black, but, like, this is not a short song, right? Like, by... It's like four and four minutes, 20 seconds or something, right? Even though the riffing is very punky, right? Very sort of stripped down. Um, And the strategy is they have a song within a song. Um, You hear when the sample started, we were at that... I can't hum it as well. Um, But uh, where they they have that sort of... uh, blast the the blast that switches into a little slayer beat and then back to the blast kind of riff mm. and then you have the dropout right and then you have that whole middle of the song which is centered on the uh you know the satanic nunfuck riff and the big kind of ornate ornate breakdown after that or the stop section and then we transition back into the original riff which has its own b riff too Mm -hmm. and you just put together those together that's the basis of a whole song there like when the sample fades out right we've just gone back to the first riff plus it's kind of um answering riff and so it's got this nested song structure which is it's not it's not quite the same as the sort of uh um loop out from the bow and return to it thing or the sort of like it's not quite what you were saying about Concrete Wins. It's a little bit different. The funny thing is the band I know that does this song writing, the song within a song thing, is like Dawn. Mm-hmm. And they <laughs> use it to make these mass, like sprawling nine-minute songs. 
in some ways out of very clearly defined parts that like there are not a lot of riffs in the songs on um slaughter sun relative to how long they are um uh but so it's a pretty sophisticated songwriting tact tactic that can be used by like a very conspicuously highbrow band and this is like the uh retard level of that right operating <laughs> like it's the same kind of this is a great example of stupid smart oh yeah no, that's that's mm-hmm. one of the fun things it's like how do you true. make a how do you make a long kind of narrative ripping punk black death song well you just write two of them <laughs> no, that, that's that's one of the joys of arch goat really is that stupid mm-hmm. smart quality of like mm-hmm. oh yeah here's our here's our ridiculous like nun fuck punk black song mm-hmm. with this incredibly sophisticated ornate solo that takes like a minute and unfolds oh. in this like wonderful leisurely and, way you know that's the other thing it gives the song a instead of uh, songs like this can feel very much like linear sequences like okay mm-hmm. here's a b c okay a b a b c okay done uh it gives the song a thing that it does that is like what dawn does is it gives the song this mountainous shape mm-hmm. right it's sort of uh it, it it's these things around the edges and then it, it's it's sort of it has this sort of uh inhuman symmetry to it you get to the middle, it escalates towards the middle, and there's this standout thing at the middle that doesn't repeat. Mm-hmm. Like, in this case, in Dawn's case, you could say, like, the crazy fucking thrash riff in the middle of Falcula, or here, like, the solo. And then we just go down the other side of the mountain towards the end, but we're, like, you know, like, s- snowboarding or whatever. Satanic <laughs> snowboarding. Well, speaking of satanic snowboarding, <laughs> we've uh, we've talked... We've talked a fair amount on the show about this whole, like, satanic speed metal idea. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, the idea of uh, kind of, oh, I don't know how you'd describe it, sort of bringing Venom's energy back with modern technique. Um, mm-hmm. Which is something Archgoat's flirted with in the past, but I don't know if they've ever done it as obviously as they do on a song right in the middle of the record called Rats Pray God. Um and so this is this is like the satanic speed metal song, but really what it is is a song based off of what I think are straight NWO BHM riffs. So, all right. Down now, I'll destroy with you. It's on that sample if you break everything down in terms of guitar that's really an extreme metal riff is that very last one even the blasting riff if you just modified the guitar slightly like just made it kind of a like a a fast palm muted stroke that would still be like an nwo bhm riff but the blasted riff is actually the blasted riff is um i was gonna say the cool thing about that is Again, one reason this is the pro version of this sound is that the blasted riff answers and continues the speed metal riff. Yes, yes, exactly. 
And the speed metal riff, like, dude, that riff is fascinating. I could talk about that for half an hour because that strange, like, squiggly shaped, very Mm -hmm. unusually timed riff that the song opens with and it keeps coming back to is... That's like 1982 NWO BHM stuff. That sounds like Iron Maiden self-titled like Charlotte the Harlot or something like that. And, you know, you'll hear versions of that kind of idea like maybe in Bathory, but where was he getting it from? He was getting it from NWO BHM. Um, and frankly, and Bathory's version would be simpler, you know? No, Bathory's versions are just that complex. Rhythmically, Depending. rhythmically, it would be more, uh, the rhythm on that is kind of, th- that riff kind of doubles back on itself in a weird way. But Bathory's speed metal riffs sound like, um, they have flourishes to them. They have the, the, the bends and the sort of, uh, the groove. Well, they de- yeah, they've definitely got flourishes and stuff. But I, I guess what I'm saying is what makes that so interesting is the fact that that, that whole kind of technique to mm-hmm. write a riff like that mm-hmm. is borderline gone nowadays. I, I don't think there's, well, there's, there's a niche. I'm, there's a niche for people who do that, actually. But there, like used, there used to be a time where metal guitarists just could do that. Now it's this very precise kind of thing. That you no, I, I, I know what you mean. There's a band called Hell Ripper that everyone likes that does something like that. I think it's called Hell Ripper. They're um, from it's a one 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 dude project from Scotland. It's just like everyone buys his shit on Bandcamp. It's I've listened to it back in the day. Like it's pretty good. It's just sort of like the the speed metal-y stuff in Bathory taken to like just like like that that becomes the center of the sound. Um, there are. Um, I know what you mean, though, that it's very marginal now. I In a second, I want you to play Charlotte the Harlot, because, like, there's stuff... I mean, like, I, I've listened to a decent amount of Maiden. I like Maiden a lot, right? And I still haven't heard that, or if I have, I don't remember it. Um, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I can... I've gone back and listened to those first Maiden records, and you hear stuff in them that I don't. So okay. I, I gotcha. Well, yeah, yeah, I can throw it on for you right now. Do, do yeah do, do it right now. while you're looking it up though i have this thought about the satanic speed metal thing it's it is true that that kind of technique exists as a well it's like a fetish it exists as this thing that's set off from everything else and that is purely a marker of being like bathory or venom right like mm-hmm. if you play a riff like that it's supposed to be you're you're doing this kind of retro worship project like hell ripper or you are a band that's doing an homage, right? It's like, oh, that's a that's a quick quote of Bathory or something, right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, God, you know, Destroyer Six 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 attempts to write riffs like that and just consistently, without fail, fails. <laughs> um, yeah. Right? Like D- Destroyer Six 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 writes un- unmusical versions of that, but in like the bad way. Um, there's riffs on concrete the first concrete wins that kind of do interesting things that are a little like that but um uh but in terms of taking that kind of riffing and inserting it into a modern uh modern war extreme war metal framework that is not deliberately retro first wave worship or whatever uh the arch goat example is a very good example. I mean, that's very well done there, and people should do it more. So I think I'm I'm trying to agree with you by a long way. But let's listen to Charlotte the Harlot. <laughs> yeah, let's just um, listen to the first minute. Obviously, this is not going to be a one to one thing. This mm-hmm. is going to be a little bit before the like really fast picking took off. Mm-hmm. But you're going to detect, I think, similar kind of phrasing ideas and that presence of that sort of old boogie rock. That's still mm-hmm. kind of like in the background of that art mm-hmm. riff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, that you 
so you can basically imagine arch code as doing like a compressed version of some of those ideas where that like really heavy blues rock syncopation is still present but it's so compressed down it has an altogether different feeling because you can hear that same sort of like odd doubling back stuff happening in some of those iron maiden riffs there I think I can hear the odd doubling back for sure, and certainly the boogie rock thing is at the basis of that kind of Bathory speed metal riffing. Um, if you want something that I think, if you want like a more direct parallel, probably like uh, Diamond Head would yeah, have yeah. something closer to that. Um, uh, but but I think I hear what you mean in terms of the like. It'd be more like the power chord riff than the lead at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah, just like kind of like an aggregate comparison. It did, and it did a kind of flourish. There's some leady flourishes at the end that had that kind of speed metal thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's uh, uh, man, you know, I feel like Eddie looked the best he ever looked on this record. <laughs> Why he was just like a guy who was kind of spooked by himself. Okay. Kind of no. a mad, yeah, really spooked punk dude. I don't know. Eddie's got to be one of the most unfortunate logos in, in metal history. Oh, it's, come on. You don't love Eddie? Come on. No. It's, th those are, those are, that always put me off Maiden for years, because I, not, because they just be like, they're like, it's like, oh, it's the ugly skull guy. It's, um, <laughs> like, like they, like, it because it has nothing to do with the music. Like, <laughs> it's, I think it, it sort of communicates that Iron Maiden sounds, like, obnoxious in a way that it doesn't. <laughs> well, it, I mean, at the time, it probably did, you know? In a certain way, yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Archcoat. Let's talk Archcoat. <laughs> it's, um... The, um... Uh, so, like, Archcoat. Okay, you know, now I'm gonna get... I'm not, I'm gonna get like mail bombed for saying that about Eddie. Um, but um, <laughs> it's uh, um, I'm gonna like open my email and it's gonna explode. Um, the uh, but um, so did did you have anything more on that song or no no we can keep going. No. I just it's interesting because Arch Goat has always been like I said up front a very heavy metal kind of mm -hmm. war metal band. I mean, I don't even really like using the term war metal because that's a very kind of retroactive thing to apply to Archgo, but whatever, we're, we're mm -hmm. here, so we'll call it. So it's like my, I guess my hot take about Archgoat is that Archgoat is cool because they just make the world's heaviest and most extreme Judas Priest songs possible. <laughs> you know, it's like there's always that, that seed of like just kind of traditional heavy metal stomp to it that really makes them different from all the imitators. I, I get what you mean about that. Yes, it has something to do with the meatiness of the music. Uh, the meatiness and headbang ability. Um, and the difference from those kinds of, like... There are no wonky atonal riffs on this. Nope. There's, there's only the kind of... The level of dissonance here is only the kind that has basically been built into slinky metal scale since Metallica, right? Or... Yep. Or protest and survive or whatever you know it's um you're not gonna get uh it's less dissonant than rain and blood right yeah um, yeah definitely yeah by by a lot um and um and so in so yeah in in that sense it is pretty different from like i don't know the best diocletian riffs or whatever have this kind of like searing a tonality to them um yeah so i i hear what you mean um Let's listen to a track called uh, All Christianity Ends.
so I kept listening to it. Um, <laughs> it sucks the end pretty good. Yeah, so... Uh, there's... um. What's interesting about this song, right, is that none of the other riffs are particularly interesting, but that one riff in the middle, holy shit. I don't know, man. I kind of like all of them a lot. <laughs> yeah, they're, the other ones are all serviceable, but it's it's um, it's um, just the... It's the, you know, it's the, you know, um, the, uh, boom, boom, boom. They really like make, they're very good at reminding you what all the riffs are clearly written, just structured around. You can tell he thinks in terms of intervals and like very simple, like, what am I going to do with the relations between these two power chords, right? This is a person who takes the power chord very seriously. Um, and like, it reminds you like like that's the first like my big minor six movement that is on the album. And when that happens, you're like, oh, I remember why I fucking love minor sixes. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it doesn't resolve exactly where you expect. It just sort of descends and crushes. Uh, um, also has a really good vocal hook on it. Oh, the, I, I think the vocals across this record are awesome. Like, the <laughs> style is so so unconventional, and but it fits the music like it. You, you know what? Also, I take it back. The rest of the riffs on that track are sick. But, um, and the vocal hook over that, right? He just goes twice. All Christianity ends. And he... <laughs> He's pronouncing it in a very not speak not uh, in in a very ESL way, which is sick. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> so good. Uh, and you can already tell that this track is like the banger or the fan the fan favorite. Um, if you scroll down, a number of people in the YouTube comments are just like, "Yeah, this is the fucking jam." Um, <laughs> and a, it has a, a good full on every arch go to help. And it, it, it has a standards. It has a really good title. Because um, it's very close to a cliche sentiment, right? Mm -hmm. If the track was called The End of Christianity, it'd be like, okay, whatever, man, right? Um, instead, it asks you to think of, like, what else is Christianity, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's pretty tight. <laughs> yeah. The Archco can get away with actually being stereotypically black metal evil, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, it also reminds you of the original impulse of the '90s, which was the whole point was not that the the whole point was not that Christianity was just people going to church. The whole point was it was the culture around them. Yeah, it was the whole society. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, uh, one thing you mentioned in the notes was that some people are comparing this to Inquisition, um, mm -hmm. which is interesting, and I, I get it, especially if you're. If you're thinking about certain Inquisition tracks, mm -hmm. like, uh, oh God, what's the one off fucking Ominous Doctrines? Uh, let me pull it up. I can never remember the titles of Inquisition well, songs. Well, there are certain gestures. So on that sample, there was one one of the more elaborate slow riffs uh, mm -hmm. after the big riff hit the first time. The, the It's structured around a boom, boom, bam, 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 bam. Not every way he works with Octave sounds like Inquisition, but that does. And there are a lot of moments yeah. like it on the record where you you make the Octave really... And the way of generating epic melodic effects without really doing any of the... Without really playing anything other than power chords. Uh, just by the well-chosen minor six and stuff and use of Octaves, that's a very Inquisition thing. Yeah, and it was interesting mm -hmm. because I had never thought of Arch Goat in conjunction with Inquisition. But then thinking back, where did I see Arch Goat? Well, they were the direct support for Inquisition on the tour where I saw them. So it's like they probably are feeding into each other in a real way. The, um, and there, it's true. They're about they're about the same age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. You can definitely see them kind of like getting ideas from each other especially in that niche of like 
slow kind of droning stuff that both of them do. And the song that I was thinking of was a desolate funeral chant off ominous doctrines, mm-hmm. which has become, you know, the, the slow inquisition song, basically. Mm-hmm. There's, um, also just the whole sort of, I mean, y- you know, I really like the grinding early inquisition, like invoking the majestic throne and mag- magnificent glorification and on both mm-hmm. of those, just like the whole, I mean, Inquisition plays a lot faster on that, but you go from the the steep deceleration and the sort of, like, specifically black metal breakdowns is, like, steeply decelerating into a, like, half-time black metal breakdown is, like, a thing that Inquisition does all the time and that Archcode has been doing from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, speaking of Inquisition, my last sample, this is probably my favorite song on the record, uh, mm-hmm. Worship the Eternal Darkness, the title track. Um, we'll just listen to some of this uh, because this definitely brings to mind Inquisition, and I don't have much to say because this song just fucking rules. <laughs> Gentlemen, I regret to inform you that the devil is here and he fucking rules. 